but he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Through the sunset stream Oh, it's windy I'm a child of God Yes, I Jesus died for me, yes he died for me, through the sun sets free, oh it's indeed, I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am
and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. In the morning that you arose, all of heaven held its breath Till the storm was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who had come, who the Father had restored and the church of God was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of old Shall not live and shall not faint By His blood and in His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me Praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Praise forever to the King of kings. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into Through the darkness, your loving kindness, though to the shadows of my soul, the work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. could imagine so great a mercy but I could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my Lord. Praise the one who 
set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Then came the morning That sealed the promise Your buried body Began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring lion Declared the grave Has no claim on me Declared the grave Has no claim on me Jesus, yours is the victory There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living Well, good morning, everybody. It's so good to be back in the pulpit here at Calvary again this Sunday morning. I am so thankful that we can meet together and we can fellowship regardless of the form that it takes. We have those of you who are online who can't make it out. We have folks in cars in the parking lot. We have those in the lawn chairs on the church lawn. And you know, we even have folks in the apartment building next to us. How exciting is that? They sit on their balconies and they watch us from there. I know that I have missed seeing faces and being together. But I am very thankful for what we are able to do. Even this morning, we got to do a baby dedication, or I should say a child dedication, for the Stevenson family. Their little guy, Benjamin, an absolute sweetheart. I, would hope, I hope that you would reach out Connect with them and just give them their support and tell them that you're praying for them. I think it would mean a lot to that family. Well, a few weeks ago, Pastor Richard made a big deal about me having my very first Father's Day. And I really had an amazing day. As a father, I love seeing parallels between how Scripture references God as our Father, how a father acts, how he loves and he cares. But for me, the most important example is how a father lays down his life to care for the ones that he loves. Guys, that is hard. Because for myself, I'm selfish. And I want things to go my way far too often. But to care for my wife and my daughter and our baby-to-be Yes, you heard that right. We are very excited because we have a baby coming in October. Our family's growing, and it's exciting. As a father, though, there's a hope in the effort of raising our kids, isn't there? We are able to go through tough days and nights knowing that our efforts are not in vain. 
Our hope is that one day our little ones will grow up to be adults who know how to love their families, their communities, but most importantly, to love God. That is my hope with my little ones. I hope it is yours as well. When I look at the book of 1 Peter, I'm reminded again of where our hope lies. You see, Peter is written to those who are in exile. These are people spread out over a vast area who are undergoing persecution because of their faith. I'm sure they are discouraged and confused. Yet Peter writes to them. He writes to bring them hope, to remind them of where and what to put their hope in. I believe that Peter is trying to make sure that his readers put their trust in the Lord no matter what life throws at them. And through these circumstances, to keep their gaze, to keep their hope fixed on God and the deliverance that he has promised. My prayer this morning is that the message that Peter wrote to these believers in trouble will be a hope for us as well. Let's pray for a moment as we jump into God's word. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you that we have the opportunity to come and to learn to grow together. Lord, I ask that you would just give me clarity of speech. Help me to slow down and to be clear with my words. Lord, I pray that as we open the word that you would use it to speak to our lives. Teach us, Lord God. Help us to know who you are deeper and deeper each and every day. You truly are an amazing God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you've turned your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1. Because we're going to jump right into verse 1 and read a little bit there. So 1 Peter, chapter 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ... To those who are elect, uh, to, sorry, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for our salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We see the greeting in the first few verses. A call to understand the three parts of God and how the Father knew this would happen. How the Spirit is sanctifying, working in us becoming holy. And finally, for obedience to Jesus Christ. I believe we could do a whole sermon series right now on those two verses, digging deep into what each part of the passage is showing us. But for today, I want us to see that God is actively involved and changing lives. And a changed life brings obedience to Christ and what he has called us to do. Folks, this is exciting. God hasn't put things into motion and then stepped away. No. He is actively in our lives working. And through this, we are given great hope. A living hope. When we jump into verse 3, we begin to see this beautiful picture of of blessing God. Our God deserves our blessing and our praise. And Peter here says it well. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? We are born again to a living hope. Isn't this incredible? When God created man in the garden, man was without sin. But mankind chose to turn and rebel against God. And we see and still live in the effects of sin. 
It destroys and distorts everything that it touches. And the relationship that we have with God was broken. But God and his great mercy, because he was within every right to destroy everything that was affected by evil, being a pure and holy God. But because of his great mercy, he chose to save us to be born again to a living hope through Jesus rising from the dead. I hope you are excited right now because we deserve death, but now we have life and a living hope. But what is that hope? I know I've used that phrase a few times already, but I believe that that, this is one of the main points in chapter 1. The question is, what is our living hope? Verse 4 says, To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, Peter was looking past this lifetime to the next. He is using comparison words one where the people he was writing to would understand. Letting them know that the things of this world are perishable. They're defiled. They fade. Look around you. Our world, the things in it, they break down, they fade away. You see, we see and feel the effects of sin every single day when we crawl out of bed. Yes, there are days that I crawl out of bed in agony too. The beautiful new cars that we buy, they break down and they rust. Our homes need touch-ups and paint. Things fade away. The audience for Peter here were people who lived in persecution. They were dispersed and they had to leave their homes because of what they believed. And yet here Peter is saying, guys, you have an inheritance that will never fade away. It can't go anywhere. And it is being kept in heaven for you. Isn't this an encouragement? To take our eyes off of the here and now, the struggles of of this world and of these days, and to look further, to look to what someday God has promised for us, a living hope. And what's more, when we get to verse 5, it says that believers... We who are born again, by God's power, are being guarded. This expression is that of a fortress protecting from enemies attacking. Through faith for our salvation that will come in the last time. This passage does not promise that life will be easy. That there will be no physical trials or struggles in life. But what it does say is, is that through our faith, our faith in what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If we hold our faith in that, then in the last time, a day when we will be with Christ, we will have salvation, an inheritance, a living hope. Folks, this is huge. For me, a a personal application of this is a few months ago I got a phone call saying that my grandfather had passed away and in my mind I ran through my theology of life and who God is I looked at who God was and how he created everything perfect with no sin but then I also saw and remembered that sin what sin does and how it breaks things and destroys them I looked at my grandfather's life and now, and how it now ended because of the curse of sin. But I also looked at the living hope that is found in Jesus. Because my grandfather loved Jesus so, 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 so much. And I was able to see the hope that he was with his Savior. That was his hope, and that is mine as well. And folks, this is our living hope one day being glorified with Jesus. And I look forward to that day. 
And it allows me to walk through life and the trials seeing that hope. I love how Peter naturally progresses through this chapter. He has started with our living hope and then he moves on to our various trials. Verses 6 to 12. Verse 6 says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels long to look. Peter here is showing us that there is hope in eternity for us. Now he tells us to live in trials. It is amazing to me that the start of verse 6 says that they are rejoicing. Now this joy seems to come out of a heart that has hope, but also while they are going through the trials. And folks, trials are hard. For these people, it was persecution and exile. For us, maybe our struggles, our trials are found with our family our co-workers, maybe financial or emotional struggles, maybe physical. We haven't reached a place, though, in our lives where our lives are in danger for what we believe. But we do go through tests and struggles, don't we? We struggle and we grieve in our trials, but there is a reason for them. Verse 7 says that our faith is tested to see if it is genuine. And we are in a given an example of gold. Gold does not last in the scheme of eternity, but will your faith? To get pure gold, you have to heat it up, put pressure on it, so that the dross, the impurities, they'll come out. Then you can scape those, uh, scrape those off, and they get, you're left with a pure gold. It's a process and one which the readers would have understood. But our faith is tested in trials. And why? So the end result would be praise and glory and honor when one day we are with God. When our salvation is made true. When it's made sure. We will praise him and give him glory and honor when we see him one day. That's exciting, isn't it? Peter talks about joy through trials, but he also talks about love in verse 8. And that there is a love that goes beyond our seeing eyes to how we believe him and what he has done for us. We believe him and rejoice. We love him even through the trials. These are the examples that Peter is laying out for us. When we have faith in Christ, we are able to hope in eternity. We are able to walk through trials and struggles in life and we are able to rejoice and love him because our eyes are set on him and the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. One day, living eternity with God. It really is amazing, isn't it? It's so amazing that it was a mystery for those in the past. I'm going to read from verse 10 to 12 here. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating 
when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels long to look. This salvation through Christ is something that they knew was coming. The prophets heard about it. They knew about it. And Peter says that they searched and they inquired carefully. They wanted details. Just like my little girl wants to know every details of a surprise or of an event before it happens. And it drives her crazy when we don't tell her. We'll go on a road trip and she doesn't know where we're going and she just goes, where are we going? I imagine that is the emotion that the prophets felt. They knew a redeemer was coming, but when would he come? Who was it going to be? But this was not the answer that they got. The answer that they got was that they were serving us. They were giving us examples in scripture that we can look to and see that scripture is true. What a blessing it is that we get to live in days when the gospel message is clear and we can understand it. Peter, now having explained the end game of our journey, looking forward to eternity, to have a living hope, to be able to go through trials, rejoicing, now he gives the believers a call to action. He goes, a there, he gives them a therefore. In essence, everything that we've talked about at, so far brings us to this point. Verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he was made manifest in last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass, grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is good news that was preached to you. Peter tells the believers that their call was to be holy. And in these verses, there are three ways in which he calls believers to be holy. In verse 13, he tells the believers to prepare their minds for action. To be sober-minded, to be self-controlled. And why? To set your hope fully on the grace that you will receive when you see Christ. Peter keeps coming back to keeping our focus on eternity. And that we need to keep our mind set on this day when we will stand before God. He continues with this pattern in verse 14 as he gives them an example of an obedient child and not following the passions of the flesh that we normally would have before our relationship with Christ. But he says, as we move to verse 15, that the one who called us is holy. 
So here is the next step. Be holy in all your conduct. Leviticus 11 is referenced with God talking to his chosen people. Be holy, for I am holy. Folks, this command, this imperative is so difficult to grab a hold of our lives and to focus on being holy, to to set aside the things that I want so that I can honor God. That's hard. But Peter isn't done yet. In verse 17, he says that if we call on him as a father, that he judges impartially. He is a good judge, and he will look at each one's deeds one day. So Peter says, guys, live your lives with fear of this day. And I believe it is a healthy fear. Just as a child doing an activity that might be questionable. And what goes through their mind about, what's mom or dad going to say when they hear about this? Maybe I won't. Peter is saying that the perfect judge is one day going to pull my life apart and judge it. So we are to set our minds on eternity. To live our lives being holy and set apart. And to live in fear of the day that we stand before him. Because we were ransomed. And this word is such a good picture. Ransomed. It means that there was a cost to us being saved. And the price was high. Gold, silver, things that passed away, they do not pay that penalty, that ransom. Verse 19 says, But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, the blood of Jesus was shed so that we could live. What a sacrifice. What an amazing God that we serve who planned this out before the world was even created. We now get to see these great truths in the scripture in front of us. Believers in God, the same God that raised Christ from the dead and gave him glory so that our faith and hope are in him. Folks, if we get this lesson and we get it well, Peter says in verse 22 and 23 that our obedience to the truth will be purifying our souls, being set apart, being holy, and that we will have a a sincere brotherly love. And this brings us to the final command here. Love one another. From a pure heart, wanting to love God, love each other. Why? Why? Because we are born again through the living word of God, not of things that are perishing. Peter finishes off by looking at Isaiah 40 and that everything falls away. But the word of the Lord stands firm. This is the good news that is preached to you. Do you see why this is so important? Why am I, ex- I am excited to dive into this book of 1 Peter? The hope that Peter lays out for those who believe that Jesus is their Savior should really get us excited. Folks, we live in days that are tough. There are trials for us, and each one of us will struggle through them in different ways. But Peter tells us through the trials we need to keep our focus on eternity because this world will fade away. But as we journey through this world, We need to keep an attitude of rejoicing and an attitude of loving God, even through the trials of life. We are then called to be holy, to separate ourselves from the former passions of this world and to live with our deeds evaluated one day standing before God because he has ransomed us through his blood. If we get this lesson and get it, understand it well, then the outpouring of our lives should be love. Loving each other from a pure heart. This is what a watching world is looking at. How we treat each other. How we go through trials. 
And where do we, we put our hope? I don't believe Peter is telling the believers to create a wall and to hide behind it and not interact with anyone else in the world. But what I do think he is doing is calling us to evaluate our lives, to really see if we are striving to become like Christ and live that way, or are we being distracted and torn away through the trials or the passions of this world? I am encouraged to set my gaze on the one who will one day welcome me home to my inheritance in heaven. I hope that you will as well. Let's pray together. Dear God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you that we can come before you. I thank you for your word, the hope of heaven, God, that living hope. God, help each and every one of us to be able to, to work on being holy this week. Show us areas of our life that, lives that need work. And God, help us to love each other through those, to encourage each other, to build each other up looking to one day when we get to stand before you. You truly are an amazing God, and I thank you and praise you for everything that you do. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Folks, it was so good having you with us today. Thank you for joining us online, and I hope I'll see you again soon. Pastor Dave signing off. Bye for now.